As the representative of Brookline Booksmith, I'm so thrilled to welcome you to our fourth event celebrating Agni's 50 years. And with that, I'm pleased to pass the screen to Agni Assistant Poetry Editor Dorsey Ulbrich, who will introduce tonight's panelists. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, and thank you to Brookline Booksmith for hosting this ongoing celebration of Agni's 50th anniversary. We also want to thank Boston University, the Massachusetts Cultural Council and the National Endowment for the Arts for their support. Uh, my name is Dorsey Craft, and I'm an assistant poetry editor at Agni. Um, we are a literary journal founded in 1972 by Ukrainian American writer Askol Melnichuk that has been co-edited by Sven Burkertz and William Pierce for 18 years. We publish two issues a year of poetry, fiction, nonfiction, hybrid work, and art, and we recently published our 95th issue. While the magazine is housed in the basement of the English department at Boston University, our team of editors lives all over the country. This series is meant to bring together our widespread editorial team and our global family of readers. For each of these conversations, we've asked our editors to invite a writer who represents Agni's shifting, evolving aesthetic. This week, we're bringing you our fourth installment in this series of celebratory conversations, a conversation between senior poetry editor Jennifer Kwan Dobbs and poet Kimiko Han. Kimiko Han's new work plays with given forms while creating new ones, and in doing so, honors past writers. Across her 10 books of poetry, she casts a wide net for subject matter. In her latest collection, Foreign Bodies, she revisits the personal as political while exploring the immigrant body, the endangered animal's body, objects removed from children's bodies, and hoarded things. Previous books, Toxic Flora and Brain Fever, were prompted by fields of science. The Narrow Road to the Interior takes title and forms from Basho's famous journals. Reflecting her interest in Japanese forms, her essay on Zuihitsu was published in the American Poetry Review. Honors include a Guggenheim Fellowship, Penn Volcker Award, Shelley Memorial Prize, and NEA Fellowships. In her service to the field, she enjoys advocating for the chapbook and has created a chapbook archive at the Queens College Library. Han is a distinguished professor at the MFA program in creative writing and literary translation at Queens College, the City University of New York. And Jennifer Kwan Dobbs is senior poetry editor of Agni and has been a part of the editorial team since 2019. Born in Wanju, Republic of Korea, she is the author of Interrogation Room, Paper Pavilion, Winner and Paper Pavilion, winner of the White Pine Press Poetry Prize, and the chapbooks Notes from a Missing Person and Necro Citizens. Interrogation Room, received mention in the New York Times, was praised by World Literature Today for a vigorous restlessness and won the Association of Asian American Studies Award in Creative Writing Poetry. She also co-translates Sami poetry with poet scholar Johanna Demokosch, and their translation of Milas Holmberg's poetry is forthcoming as Underfoot in spring 2022 from White Pine Press. Um, Quan Dobbs has received grants and awards for her writing, most recently a Jerome Hill Artist Fellowship and a Minnesota State Arts Board Artist Initiative grant, and published work in Crazy Horse, Jubilat, Agni, the Massachusetts Review, Poetry International, and elsewhere. She is professor of creative writing at St. Olaf College, where she directs race and ethnic studies and is visit visiting faculty at Universitat Bielefeld. Jennifer Kwan Dobbs is the editor with Shuchi Saraswat of Futures, an Agni portfolio of work in translation. Without further ado, uh, please enjoy this conversation between Kimiko Han and Jennifer Kwan Dobbs. Thank you so much, Dorsey, and um, welcome everyone. Thank you so much, Brooklyn Brooksmith and um, Agni for this series of Agni Conversations. Kamiko, welcome to you. Cannot Thank be more you. delighted to be in conversation with you. 
um, when Agni approached me um, about thinking about the kind of conversation I'd like to have, I realized I've been having conversation with your work as a reader for a very long time, since 1989, when um, um, you know the, the first book, Air Pocket, came out. So I, I, I want to share with um, the audience a little bit that um, in thinking about our conversation, given this luxurious stretch of time, we had discussed you know, the opportunity of a kind of retrospective conversation of looking back over your body of work, thinking about themes. That conversation is going to unfold as a kind of um, um, uh, opportunity of a dialogue with some poems punctuating that you selected that have been important to you. And um, I want to encourage the audience to post questions in the chat or to also post questions um, in the Q&A. There'll be time for a Q&A afterward. Um, for, for myself, um, I think a, a word that kind of sums up um, the feeling for me about your work, Kimiko, is what a long journey going back from 1989, reading your work as, a, as an undergraduate um, at Oklahoma State, with Lisa Lewis guiding me to your work. Um, when back in you know the late 80s, it's not like there was an Asian American archive where poets could go and where a student could go and Google. I mean, there just wasn't that as we know. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, you know, just sort of thinking about origins for a moment, um, you know, your, your poem, Air Pocket, um, I think has so many, well, sorry, your collection, Air Pocket, in particular, um, the last poem, um, Resistance, a poem on ACOT cloth, introduces so many important motifs that um, have shifted and changed and grown across your, your long career of 10 collections. And, um, you know, some illustrative lines that, are, that maybe speak to those signatures, you know, from like the early 1990s um, include things like um, centuries earlier, you've been courted or sold, Murasaki mother, referring to um, uh, Murasaki Shikubu. Um, you need more than a female persona, linked sections with fragrance. Um, and then like one more um, quick um, excerpt. And then the rhythm of Choi, imagine a daughter in my lap. I'm wondering if you can just to kick us off, talk a bit about your origin story as poet. Sure. Um, first of all, thank you uh, on the editors um, and Jennifer and staff, Dorsey, and also uh, Alex at Brookline Booksmith. Um, this is really an honor for me. Most people don't uh, look back any further than a book or two uh, with um, a poet who has um, a mid or late career <laughs> poet. So thank you. This is an honor and, and uh, very special for me. Um, I love that question, um, origin story. Um, what, came, what came to mind um, and what comes to mind first is um, the stories my mother told me, my mother read to me. And one actually was an origin story itself. And that is Rudyard Kipling's How the Rhinoceros Got His Skin. And I, mm -hmm. that's actually the epigraph in my, in my first collection, Air Pocket. Um, the last paragraph, which I've printed out here, I've cut and paste rather, um, used to make me laugh so hard when I was a little girl. It was just a series of place names. Um, so the Parsi went away in the direction of Orotavo, Amigdala, the upland meadows of Anantarivo, and the marshes of Sonaput. And I just remember hearing the word Sonaput. And, you know, for a child, these are just, these place names are just magical, they don't mean anything, but they're just so wonderful sounding. And um, I'd say that's part of my origin story. And um, the, the idea too, that uh, although I grew up speaking English, I heard a lot of Italian in the first two years of my life and then some Japanese uh, later on. So I grew up knowing that there was more than one way to say things and to mean things. So these playful um, place names uh, were, were very captivating. Mm -hmm. um, 
I am aware of the irony that it's uh, Rudyard Kipling, uh, imperialist, mm -hmm. <laughs> that he was one of my early delights. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't shy away from irony. I try and explore that and hopefully let my work become more complex rather than one dimensional because of that kind of exploration. So a lot of different influences, a lot having to do with the sound of language itself, the playfulness of language, um, that language for me is, is, is really a thing. There, it's mm -hmm. almost an object. It, I can feel language in my mouth almost, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I guess that's uh, part of my answer in terms mm. of origin, just mm. language itself. Mm -hmm. I know so many um, powerful threads here. I'm, I'm thinking, for example, moving to your next collection, um, Earshot, the ways in which, you know, words, that thinginess of words, yeah. right? When you hold them in your mouth, how the words also like shape your mouth, mm. they act upon your body. Yes. Um, and, you know, the, the fact that um, being able to have those words, oftentimes it, it has historically been a gendered matter, right? Mm -hmm. Highly gendered. Yeah, um, absolutely. Highly gendered. And um, what I love about your poem Revolutions is that you're threading together, you know, the stories of your mother, as you were saying, and just with your origin, um, um, you know, your thoughts about your origins um, as a poet, the stories of your mother, the thinginess of language, yeah. how being in a space of multilinguality, it's priming your ears to really hear those edges. I, I'm wondering as a way to kind of center and ground us and all those amazing motifs that you just shared uh, that are so key to your origins. If you wouldn't mind reading um, Revolutions from your shot for sure. us. Sure. Thank you. I haven't read this in a while. <laughs> <clears throat> Revolutions. Forbidden to learn Chinese, the women wrote in the language of their islands. And so Japanese became the currency of high aesthetics for centuries, as did the female persona, the pine, the longing. This is the truth. We can rise above those needles. The red silk from my grandmother amazes me. Think of the peasant immigrating from rice fields to black volcanic soil, the black beaches, the children black in this sunlight against the parents' will or aspirations. Anywhere else, girls of mixed marriages would be prostitutes or courtesans. I want those words that gave women de facto power, those religious evocations Dreams so potent, she became pregnant, or men killed, or the mistress died in pain. I connect to that century as after breath is knocked out, we suck it back in. The words the men stole, after all, to write about a daughter's death or their own soft thigh belongs to us, to me. Though translation is a border we look over or into sometimes a familiar noise, elegant confusion, but can meaning travel the way capital moves like oil in the Alaskan pipeline or in tankers in the Straits of Hormuz? Can those sounds move like that? Yes, but we don't understand, but we don't know what it means to speak frankly, even to ourselves. Patricia, fertility is not the antithesis of virility, I can't help it. If I could translate the culture women cultivate, I would admit to plum, P-L-U-M, and plum, P-L-U-M-B. I always begin with a season, like snow and plums in the wooden bowl make me love him, how I warm one in my fist, then lick it until the skin grows so tender it bursts beneath my breathing. The yellow is brilliant. The snow is warm. Some of our lessons issue from song because there are never enough older sisters, especially from the South via Detroit, 
where we look for a model with the desperation of a root, where a bride is a state, where heat lightning is pronounced, lie down on my breast, so your tongue and teeth reach my tit and I can, where, yes, I didn't learn poetic diction from the classics, rather transistor radios, confidence in my body also after years and the confidence that gives and gives and is not afraid to take either. Exploring the words means plunging down, not skimming across or watching white caps, however lovely, not balking at fear either. The walls are filled with sounds, the windows with sorrow. Revolution, for example, is the soft, exact orbit of planet, moon, seed. Also seizing the means of production for our class. Where did that come from? It all begins with women, she said, like the warp and woof of cloth. And how there's no free verse, so we'll search for the subtle structures, the poetic closure, the seven kinds of ambiguity, etc. Not tonight, dear. How it's not so sad, really, for a husband or wife to come alone. Komachi's reputation came from legend. The 99th time a lover visited her door, the night before she would let him enter, he died. That's the breaks. And a patriarchy is such cruelty. Cruelty? or survival? Is the father to blame for ugly daughters too, for the unruly ones? Come, sit by the radiator and open window. When the baby hiccuped inside her, her whole body shook. Afterbirth is not a time or reform. It belongs to a separation we turn towards. I love that poem and- Thank you. It's such a joy to hear you read it. Thank you, Kamiko. I, 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 I can't help but really hover, you know, just in, in my um, in my mind, hover um, around the the lines about women's speech, the power of women's speech, about the power of women speaking to one another, especially whether it's story, whether it's pushing against and even crossing some of those. Yes. borders that have been gendered about what women get to speak about um, and how important speaking with one another is to women knowing themselves and um, also how taboo sometimes being able to speak frankly and apologetically um, speaking where one is taking knowledge for themselves how sometimes that um historically in a patriarchal context, imperialist context too, let's be honest, yes. has been so um, outlawed and criminalized as it were. Um, I think for me, um, as a, a lifelong reader of your work, the fact that you created the space, like I'm thinking about the character L, for example, mm -hmm. you know, um, the fact that you created this interlocutor who's female to ask questions that may seem like female questions, but they're universal questions about poetry and creation. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about, you know, like what revolutions as a poem, one that you had selected as being a touchstone, how is a touchstone, it helped you with moving toward some of the later poems like the Zuihitsu, for example, mm -hmm. that are more dialogic, that take some of those motifs and move it even more into the structure of exploring irony which as you said, has always been a signature in the work. Oh, thank you. Um, well, just um, a, a kind of note on, on some of the references in this poem and why it is important to me. Um, so here I go with my lecturing. Um, around the year 1000, um, Japanese literature was dominated. It was the golden age of Japanese literature and it was dominated by women because the men, of course, this is the aristocracy, uh, were uh, educated, but they were educated in Chinese. So it was like um, people being educated in Latin 
right? Mm -hmm. And so they were writing in Chinese, not their language. They were writing and they were adopting um, images and, and conventions from another country. And these were already uh, older, you know, from, from, another, from another period as well. The women who were not educated in Chinese were writing in Japanese. So mm. they were writing in a language that was part of their body. They were writing what they were seeing and feeling and smelling. So it, it just imbued everything and the power of, of the Japanese language and of the literature and of expression. Um, I mean, that to me is one of the most um, inspiring um, um, uh, periods and elements. Uh, I, I, look, I look towards that period uh, for, um, for inspiration, really, and, and for subject matter, <laughs> uh, especially in this case. Um, and the ability to express um, anger, rage. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was born in the 50s. And certainly, uh, although I know this is true of some of my even undergraduates, um, uh, for girls to get angry, that was mm. bad. You were a bad girl. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you were getting if you're angry. You know, it's more like be quiet, sit down, be good. Um, mm. And so to push back, to get my own voice, to acquire my own voice, to develop my own voice was really a matter of connecting to all the emotions. Rage being at the top of the <laughs> list, right? Um, and so this was a safe space to do that. Um, in this particular poem, I also have um, wordplay, the word revolutions uh, being the most obvious. Um, and as I said, reference to past writers and traditions, juxtaposing uh, different kinds of diction. Um, and, and also, as I said, claiming a mm -hmm. feminist and or, and or a female informed tradition, which, um, and, and again, it's, the irony doesn't escape me. These were very, these aristocratic women were very bitchy. <laughs> they really looked down on, on peasants and anyone who was not of their, of their class. So I, I understand that, but I also embrace what they accomplished. Hmm. I, I feel that with your Zuihitsu in particular, the way that you've interpreted the form, that you've been able to open it up in ways to where these kinds of ironies like you were naming, right? Like with how the um, form, you know, historically in the hands of these elite women, right? May have been so self-enclosed, Yes. right? But I feel that, especially in some of the early um, Zuihitsu, you know, like in possession, for example, which I think is another one that you selected and also for me has been very important too. And sort of seeing like how you were doing wordplay with this idea of possession, not only as an inspiration that um, in some ways is so overwhelming, um, you know, a, a personhood kind of opens up, right? Mm -hmm. But then also how it has capitalist overtones of property. Yes. Right. And means of production. Yes. And. Um, you know, it also strikes me that not only are you working in this feminist um, uh, mode that you've invented, but also anti-imperialist one around, around labor and really questioning that means of production. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. That's, a very, yeah. that's a very important element. I mean, that's part of my, uh, uh, that's part of my roots, uh, Marxism, socialism. I'm mm -hmm. a child of that era. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Um, mm. And the Zuihitsu, um, of course, we think of um, Seishonagon, the pillow book of Seishonagon. She was writing during that period that I just mentioned, the Heian period. Um, so she was one of the important writers. And uh, she really, uh, she didn't invent the form but she's who we think of um, as the one who wrote and gave us um, uh, 
uh, so many uh, zuihitsu, some as long as one sentence, some in translation, several pages long. Um, and for me, what's interesting, uh, I keep calling it a form, but it really is not a form. The zuihitsu is a genre in and mm. of itself. Um, mm. It takes different forms, right? So sometimes it looks, it appears like a list, sometimes prose, a diary entry. Um, it's very difficult to find an actual definition of a zuihitsu. Um, I tried to write, uh, tried to write a, a definition and I, I wrote an essay that was in American Poetry Review um, a year and a half ago. Uh, in my attempt to understand it, because in part I couldn't find a definition. So some of the hallmarks are utter subjectivity, mm. which is incredible permission, right? You don't have to be a good girl. You can <laughs> let it loose, <laughs> right? Utter subjectivity. Um, spontaneity, which goes against the grain of, for example, the Western essay, right? where you have to have a topic sentence and, so, and follow through very logically, right? Um, I have a little essay in Narrow Road, a little Zuhitu in Narrow Road to the Interior called Pulse and Impulse. And in that, I try and explore, in part, the idea of intuition for women, right? We've been accused in a sense of being intuitive creatures. That's great. <laughs> I love being intuitive. <laughs> and it doesn't mean that I can't be logical, although <laughs> more intuitive than logical, but to embrace what has been hurled at us as a weakness Mm. And to see it as part of my poetics, that a zuihitsu should feel intuitively, spontaneously rendered. It doesn't mean that it was never revised, but it feels that way. That's, those, those are incredibly important. And, and I, it does feel female to me. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how Japanese would feel, <laughs> but it absolutely feels female to me. Mm. And also, I, I feel too, um, you know, within this space of an Asian American context, right, of, you know, occupying the multiplicities of, as you were saying, hearing multiple languages, um, identifying the ridges and the textures of multiple languages as a consequence, being really attuned to that, you know, there, there are ways in which these um, um, inheritances, received traditions, you know, can be remade within an Asian American context that even that term can be remade in many ways. It doesn't signify something static. Um, you know, I, I'm wondering, going back to the, to this character of L, right? To this interlocutor, um, who for me has just been really revelatory. You know, oh. the, the way in which um, dialogue with L opens up narrow road to the interior, for example, which really ponders the genre of Zuhitsu, it seems to me. Um, I noticed though that it seems like there are many um, interlocutors throughout your body of work. So I, I don't wanna just- Oh, interesting. <laughs> focus on L, but like, or maybe there are ways in which the interlocutor shifts here and there. Maybe it's not that there's a multiplicity, but maybe the interlocutor herself has so many multiple facets. Yes. I guess what I'm wondering is what remains constant, but also what remains, you know, kind of mobile, dynamic in that sense for mm -hmm. you with this interlocutor. Um, I think um, my themes mm. remain like a baseline, right? Mm. Um, I've uh, adopted the, uh, um, the phrase identity theme from mm. another writer um, because I realized very early on as I was writing the poems that would become uh, earshot actually, that I kept writing about the same theme, the same stuff, which is basically jealousy, envy, and betrayal, <laughs> all that good stuff in the tale of Genji. Um, mm -hmm. 
and so I thought, well, if I'm going to keep writing the same stuff, <laughs> what I would later describe as an ident as identity themes, how can I deepen mm -hmm. deepen my relationship to those themes? So mm. I decided to deep dive, right? So I would do that and, and, and to allow things again to be complex, mm. right? So to look at say uh, jealousy as, uh, well, jealousy is a kind of triangle, right? In between parent, uh, two parents and a child or parent, uh, a sibling rivalry, parent and sibling and oneself, or obviously a love interest um that is threatened so um to to and to see where the relationship is uh mm -hmm. in that i think is i think is uh interesting and important and um it makes a difference to me as a person to explore this so yeah the questioner or the points mm -hmm. of view uh of the questions shift but oftentimes the theme uh, revolves, if you will, going back to revolutions, revolves around, um, uh, yeah, the theme. So it's a sort of thematic, well, I called it a baseline before. I guess I'm using a lot of different metaphors tonight. <laughs> a mess of metaphors. <laughs> But the foreground, does, that, does that make sense to you that the in terms of what stays the same? Mm, absolutely. And you know, thinking again about the the image of transistors, right? It's mm. it's about it seems to me what is amplified and deepened, right? The tones that are um honed sort of zoomed in on, as it were, but there there are some like um essential pieces, right? Mm. It seems to me. I was wondering, um, maybe to kind of anchor us even more, if you'd like to read Possession or maybe excerpts from a, another Zuhitsu that has been really important to you. Uh, let's see, I have it going here. So for Possession, uh, as I said, um, Sorry, I'm trying to line up the pages here as I, as I give a little patter. Um, the Zuhitsu can appear as a list. So for me, what I wanted to do was explore the word possession as you were, as you were beginning to describe. So I have quotes here from uh, the tale of Genji. Um, and also from the Wall Street Journal. Possession. That mother sat beside Yoko and spoke to her before any of us knew about her death, told her to take care of father, go take care of him, who was in critical condition, but also did not know about this death that only the detectives and paramedics knew, strangers who would transfer news not new to them that when Yoko dances, her face becomes the face of her teacher from childhood. So to view her is to see someone else who moments earlier was a student. That as a toddler, she would situate herself in the backyard and know where to dig up porcelain doll parts, a glass medicine bottle, a rusted bracelet with the initial M and her private archeology. span that the father painted Adam and Eve with Adam's face turned away as his own father turned away from him that I write without thinking. Mine, no mine. You get your fucking hands off him, girl. You won't have hands for shit. In the end, the warehouse club industry's acknowledged low cost operator uses its size and market clout to bleed rivals dry. Wall Street Journal, 1993. Retail consultant Peter Monash estimates that Sam's Club cannibalizes itself in 45% of its markets in a quest 
uh, in quest of a dominant market share. Wall Street Journal, 1993. The idea of using so much cash to suppress voter turnout rather than to increase it struck many as something new and odd, 1993 that when he tests a pen, he always and unconsciously writes, but mom, that when the five-year-old tantrums, she alters her demand as the parent yields chocolate milk to white, not this cup, not this spoon, cleave to the soul. When something else is in control of the body, gestures, organs, voice, there is a vast difference between private and personal property, one which the bourgeoisie has blurred to antagonize and terrorize the working class. At issue, who owns the means of production, including one's labor? His son died over 10 years ago, and only now has he resumed consciously writing about the death as surely as grief transforms into something else a rocking chair, turpentine, sesame bath oil, turkey soup. The critic wants her to write identifiably revolutionary, quote unquote, poetry, so he can critique it in terms of his sectarian past rather than explore future possibilities. Quote, the strangest thing was that her robes were permeated with the scent of the poppy seeds burnt at exorcisms. She changed clothes repeatedly and even washed her hair, but the odor persisted. The tale of Genji. The dispossessed. I saw a red bucket, then I saw a red car, then I saw a fire hydrant, then I saw bricks, then I saw a stop sign, and the elephant I lost was red and will never find it psychosomatic blindness. Whether he traveled or stayed home, he could not stop thinking about his deceased wife. Mm. Just really love, um, and the Zoihitsu, the kinships that are revealed, the kinship among meanings that are revealed, right, that that word actually has and how sometimes those um, meanings betray each other in really <laughs> insightful ways, right? That might have been kind of latent, like, you know, not necessarily visible. Um, and I'm really struck by the line about um, the critic wanting one kind of meaning. Oh, yeah. Going back to the essay, right? And the, the structure that only allows for one maybe kind of narrative meaning held in the moment, even though it's, you know, essay to try. Yeah. 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 And this was actually based on a real um, book review I received by a very political male writer who criticized my work for being too domestic and not political. And I thought, who are you to tell me? <laughs> what is political and what a woman should be writing. It was, it was really um, it was very damaging, potentially damaging. <laughs> I got to <laughs> the subject matter, obviously. <laughs> and, and what? <laughs> it's just kind of my, 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 my take. I mean, again, like women's questions, women's spaces are political, are universal. It's not like there's only like this one, one note. And I, I love how your Zuihitsu take up so much space, pages oh. and pages, how they take up so much space across the page. It's this powerful women's anti-imperialist space of just, <laughs> look at these ironies, changing your mind midway, you know, like all the emotional bandwidth, right? And, um, you know, like one, um, Zuhitsu that you had also pointed to that um, has been really powerful to me too um, is the is the hemisphere. Oh. 
And, you know, I, I think for myself coming of age as a poet, like I read a lot of critical theory, but did not necessarily want that theory to um, become my voice as it were. Mm -hmm. But I, I feel like in an Asian Americanist context, especially like in the late eighties, early nineties, it's, it's not like these things are hard and fast, maybe like in a, like there's a sense of community, shared commitments, mm -hmm. right? Where um, there's shared care, I guess is what I'm trying to hmm. get at. Oh, I like that. Yeah, yeah. shared care. Um, I'm wondering if you can, you know, just, unfortunately, I don't think we have time to go deeply into the hemisphere, but if you can maybe talk about, um, you know, what was important about that particular poem, sort of thinking about going, looking ahead to some of your collections. I, I really want to make sure that we get to charming lines from <laughs> the artist's Thank daughter. <laughs> Such a powerful um, poem. Yeah. Thank you. Well, then, uh, just a word on the hemisphere. I was reading uh, Said, Said's mm -hmm. Orientalism, and I came to the part that uh, where he wrote about uh, Flaubert, whose work I love. Um, mm -hmm. And, and he wrote that Flaubert's writing uh, was so influential that uh, Europeans viewed the Orient and mm -hmm. the Oriental woman uh, through his writing. So he introduced the Orient to Western readers. Um, now, a lot of what informed Flaubert was his sex tours. <laughs> Let's just call it what it is. There were sex tours to Egypt, and he saw a, a, a courtesan in this one particular woman uh, a number of times, and he wrote incredible letters, incredible letters about her. So when I found, uh, when, I, when I read about that in Said, and then when I found those letters, mm. um, I thought, I, I need to engage with this. I want to write in her voice, but then I hit a I, I hit a speed bump, and I thought, well, who are you to mm. speak for her? You're a tenured, <laughs> a tenured, uh, you know, woman born in the mid, you know, in the middle of the century, um, and so I had to, right, shift the point of view again, mm -hmm. and I had her say that to me who the fuck do you think you are trying to speak for me you know so to really play with the point of view and to to ask myself that um to speak to speak in her voice but then also uh, uh for me to speak about her anyway to allow those facets um uh and the sexuality to really uh interplay Mm. That was incredible fun. <laughs> mm. I mean, that's so powerful, you know, and thinking about how this genre of the suites it creates this space where women can disagree with each other, right? Yes. But yeah. women can hold each other, you know, um, accountable, like pressing them, asking questions, even within the poem, right? Like with, um, um, you know, the interlocutor here, mm -hmm. right? Um, like how asking the poet, well, you know, these kinds of questions that um, provide a depth of, of care. Again, I, I keep going back to that, that word, a care for language, a care for each other as, as women. Yes. Um, and creating that space where women can argue with one another, can disagree with each other, and it leads to something incredibly powerful and, and, and meaningful, it seems to me. It's, it's, um, they can, I mean, we have in the past and now we do it more publicly <laughs> and in print <laughs> and video <laughs> absolutely true um but you were talking a bit about your your artistic process when it came to um writing the hemisphere and i know in our conversations and thinking about um, our conversation together right now you had mentioned the importance of um charming lines Right, a poem, "The Ashes," which, as you shared with me, you've been working—you had worked for years on. Can you talk about it? Well, 
if you mind reading maybe some of charming lines and talk a little bit about that artistic process of of moving from charming lines to sure. ash, the ashes. Sure. Absolutely. Um, I wrote uh, Charming Lines, uh, which is in eight sections, uh, and I gave my uh, seven sections. <laughs> I gave myself a little um, assignment. I love I love to give myself assignments, uh, writing prompts, and so forth. And so uh, I gave myself a certain number of lines. Um, each section had to repeat one particular line. So in this case, it was. Uh, as she twirls around, her skirt swirls up. So kind of a, a, a sassy little line. Each one is, uh, needs to mention, needs to somehow signal a different um, Grimm's fairy tale and then shift to something that feels abruptly uh, belonging to the poet. So I was trying to do a lot. Uh, th there were other little rules that I gave myself to. Every line is end stopped except for one set. So there were, there were a lot of little um, um, uh, uh, rules that I gave myself, probably too many, but it, it, it produced this and I was very happy with it. So it was in uh, The Artist's Daughter. And it just so happened that my editor, Jill Bailowski, who's a wonderful poet and writer herself, um, ended up really liking this particular poem of the whole book. Um, so when later after the book came out and I hit, uh, um, years later, I hit again, kind of what I'm calling a speed bump, not a writer's block. <laughs> um, I, I was trying to think, well, what can I, what assignment can I give myself? And I remember charming lines. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, okay, I'm gonna try not that exactly, but something where there's a kind of pivot. Um, so I'll read just one little section from charming lines. Um, so this one uh, cites uh, Little Red Riding Hood. The girl adores her pink dog. Her mother adores her and her own mother. As she twirls around, her skirt swirls up. She may not bring her dog to her grandmother, whose fever is hectic. The long pink path collapses. The red cloak, the basket, the jagged teeth, the hot smell as if grandmother left the iron on. So um, I, I feel that uh, when I when I finally finished Ashes, that was uh, in my last book, Foreign Bodies, that it was a poem that I've been trying to write for decades. Mm -hmm. um, so I gave myself, as I said, uh, similar, not exactly the same assignment, and um, wrote about Ashes in different ways, and in this uh, mostly, we're calling the Ashes, my mother's Ashes. Mm -hmm. um, and the poem, uh, it's a long poem, and it was really dull. <laughs> it was just didn't have any electricity at all. So I went back, I put aside, went back into it, and I decided to apply something I had learned from reading Emily Dickinson, and that is how to give agency mm. to objects. So I moved back in and every little section has some kind of personification going on. Mm -hmm. and it just twisted the whole poem. And I had, I, as, I, as I went through and revised, I had more wordplay, which automatically makes the chronology spatial. It breaks mm -hmm. open the wordplay. I changed my mind, right? I, I'll say, well, that was, that's when my mother went swimming. And then in another section, she'd never learned how to swim, right? So I, I, I move around a lot in these, little, in these little pieces. And then in the end, I wasn't, I realized that it ended with, um, I'll read the second to last uh, stanza. Mother showed our little girl how to sift flour. 
and how to crank an egg beater. After father lost her, he barred us from his rooms and yard where at night long red worms slithered up from the ground. I originally thought that's the end. I like mm -hmm. that, I'm satisfied. But I realized that I saw a friend reading it on my behalf and I saw that she was turning the page to continue it. And I thought it doesn't, it, I like the closure, but it's, it isn't completely closing. So mm -hmm. I took what I learned from uh, Crown of Sonnets and I mm -hmm. took a line from every section and made it the last stanza. So the last line is, the last line comes from the, um, the little section I just read uh, with some revision. She doggedly showed grandmothers how to graft flowers instead of um, sift flour. So there's echoes, there's a different kind of closure to it. So um, yeah, it, it's a poem I think I've been trying to write for decades. Mm. It's, a, it's a gorgeous poem and um, you know, I, I, I didn't realize actually that the ending was a kind of, I don't know if it's an envoy necessarily, but it reads in, in such a fresh way. And I, I know that you've said previously in some of your other work that an ending is not closure necessarily. And it, I don't feel like the, the poem necessarily, like a door is shut. Exactly. It, feels like, it feels like there's a pause. Oh, good. <laughs> yes, yes. And um, I, I hate that we are running out of time here. <laughs> Where, where you know the the zoom portal has to shut that's right but but i do want to ask you though kind of as a as a place to pause um you know what has it been like to revisit your work in this way you know to to look back over key touchstone poems i know there were so many more that we weren't able to get to for example you know the poem like lavinia for, for instance <laughs> Yeah, my, my oh, burial. That's one of my top hits. <laughs> I feel like we need at least another two to three hours. <laughs> but you know, like, what has it been like to kind of look back over those touchstones for you? Well, first of all, as I said, it's it's a real honor um, to have someone who has read my work so thoroughly. So thank you so much, and for the invitation. Um, the poems for me both belong to me, they belong to my body, but they also feel like they were written by someone else. <laughs> we're talking decades, over decades. Um, I recently heard a poet note that once a poem is published, it's no longer hers. And I thought, oh, that's, that's interesting. Yeah, the text, uh, it, it, it belongs, but once it's published, it's, it's also given away in a very, in a sense. And so it doesn't completely, I don't completely possess it to bring the word possession back in. Um, mm. I feel proud and protective of the woman who found her voice and mm. who took a chance to express herself, especially rage and to play with um, Eastern and Western traditions. Mm. Um, and uh, in looking over my work again, I realize how bound I am to past writers, how I talk back to mm -hmm. them, flirt with them, mess with them. So I apprentice myself to them. Emily Dickinson, I certainly apprenticed mm -hmm. myself to her work as much as I've, as much as I could during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. so, so thank you. It was, um, it was a journey. <laughs> well, thank you, Kimiko. Um, I, as I'm pulling up the Q&A to um, here in the last few minutes to take some questions. I'm wondering if you can share a little bit about what's next for you. Agni was so privileged to publish um, a, a poem, I think from a project into, you know, that's currently in process. Can you talk a little bit about what's next for you? Sure. Um, I think I'm finished with a new manuscript. We'll see how I feel. Um, I have some friends um, who are gonna read it for me. Um, and give me some notes, some feedback. 
Um, the poems I've been writing in the past uh, five plus years, um, at this point, probably seven plus years, have been mostly in form, uh, a lot of Western forms. Uh, I've always had a, um, a wish to write Sestinas and for decades I was never able to. And then something turned and changed for me. Uh, so I wrote a bunch of Sestinas and also what I thought I had invented, but did not, a short Sestina called a Quartina, Quartina. So as opposed to six words, there are four words much easier <laughs> so, and 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 really really fun so so uh, uh writing those and also uh let's see the the poem that was in agni actually was originally a uh, cartina so i mm. used four words and then i have the ghost of some of these forms because i i feel like the poem is actually inside that draft, the draft, mm. the Sestina draft, for example. Mm. And so it's not going to be a Sestina any longer, but it will still have the ghost. It'll still have the echo of the mm -hmm. Sestina. Mm. So the poems in in this manuscript are 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 formal and not. Um, we have about three questions. Like I said, I wish we had like two to three hours more. Um, <laughs> Thank you. But the conversation continues. The conversation continues in a lot of different ways. So um, we have a terrific question from Marilyn Berkman. Do you ever rewrite your younger poems or do you hesitate to change the voice? I'm sorry, would you say that again? I was thinking, hi, Marion Berkman. <laughs> would you read the question again? Sorry. Sure. Marilyn um, said, do you ever rewrite your younger poems, or do you hesitate to change the voice? Hmm. Um, I, at some point, I hope to have a selected, and mm -hmm. I think I would like to tweak them, not an overhaul. But um, I didn't go through an MFA program myself. I had a lot of incredible undergraduate uh, workshops. Um, but I, I didn't, the advantage that I, 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 that I think I missed was a little bit more honing and that mm. those skills. So sometimes I feel that those early poems could use me, the professor, <laughs> move back in and say, mm, maybe, maybe you can break that open a little bit more. Um, mm. But, but we'll see. Because I'm, yeah, I, I'd like to help that younger self just push, push a little bit more. Mm. We have a terrific question from Paisley Rectal. Um, Hi, Paisley. <laughs> Paisley asks, considering your fascination with form and that some of your forms play with something close to lyric nonfiction, have you thought about writing essays? Writing essays. Um, well, I have written uh, a couple of essays, um, but they're really more proper essays, right? One on the Zuihitsu, one on poetic closure. Um, I think my... Um, Zuhitsu might be as close as I'm able to get right now to creative nonfiction. Um, having said that, um, I'm teaching, uh, I, I've been teaching a class on hybrid text and using Paisley's wonderful work. Um, and that may be a way into um, a, a form that's more creative nonfiction. Yeah. Thank you for that question. And one final question from Bill Pierce, Agni co-editor. Kamiko, could you talk about changes over the decades and people's readers' reception, specifically to the openness and subjectivity that you've insisted on, prized, studied, and spent collections honing? Oh. Um... No. <laughs> um, well, I, I, 
once I was uh, at a reading at uh, Asian American Writers Workshop, this was many, many years ago, and a young woman came up to me afterwards and she was about to say something and she just started weeping. Mm. And I thought, I, I'm doing something, I'm doing something. <laughs> I'm, I've given her a gift mm. and, um, and she gave me one back. She gave me one back. Um, so I think that's maybe an answer. <laughs> um, we'll see. Sometimes I think that because I talk back to writers so often that maybe people will not want to read a poem that references Elizabeth Bishop. Maybe they're like, oh, who cares about Elizabeth Bishop? Um, I don't know. But it's it's what I've been doing, so I have to just follow that. Mm. See? Yeah, again, I as a lifelong reader of your work, I've just really loved the spaces. You know, you mentioned spatiality. I just love the spaces that hold together. Emily Dickinson with <laughs> Lady Mursaki Shikabu, and also feeling like that's a space that is nourishing to me as a poet. Oh, thank you. I'm gonna. I want to extend deep thanks to you for your body of work and for the honor of being able to have a conversation with you for Agni Conversations. Thank you so much, Kamiko. Feeling is very mutual. So thank you, Jennifer and Agni. Yes. Again, my, my gratitude to you, Kamiko, to Agni, to everyone being here tonight. Thank you all. Take good care.